Welcome to the Potter's House Sam and Arm podcast. We are a Bible-believing church located in beautiful British Columbia, Canada. We are proudly part of the Christian Fellowship Ministries with 3,000 churches around the world. We are a church focused on world evangelism, discipleship, and church planting. Here we will share recent sermons from PHSA Church and other sermons from throughout our fellowship. I am Pastor David Bigford, and I will be your host for this podcast. I thank you for listening today, and we hope these messages are a blessing to you and bring you closer to God. Hello, and welcome back to the Potter's House Salmon Arm podcast. My name is David Bigford. I'm the pastor here in Salmon Arm, and today's message that I have put together is called Abimelech's Conspiracy, the Murderous Son of Gideon. And so as we jump into this message today, the the text that we're going to be working through as our our launching pad is Judges 9 uh, verses 1 through 6. So Judges 9 verses 1 through 6. So if you're following along, you can go ahead and turn there. So I wanted to first start off with an illustration on humility. An elderly minister who survived the great Johnston flood of 1889 loved to regale audiences with tales of that harrowing event. When he died died and went to heaven, he found himself in a meeting of the saints who were sharing their life experiences. He took St. Peter aside and asked if he could tell about surviving the Johnston flood. Peter hesitated, then said, well, you can tell your story. But just keep in mind that Brother Noah will be in the audience. So then David Jeremiah writes, There's something in our human flesh that loves to tempt us to talk about ourselves. How big, tall, great, smart, wealthy, or wise we are. Even how humble we are. But God has this way of helping us learn that we're not quite what we would like others to believe. In fact, to prompt a little humility in us, he tells us that our great deeds are like filthy rags in Isaiah 64, 6. It's not that God doesn't want us to be lifted up. It's just that he wants to exalt us his way, not the world's way. He wants us to see that our greatness is because of Christ's greatness, not because of ours. So next time you're tempted to talk about yourself, look around the room and see who God is might have in that place. I like this illustration for many reasons, but the the biggest reason I do is because I, I give a lot of you know speeches and you know sermons and different things, but even in in the course of the week, you know, I, I, I work in sales as well. So you're giving presentations and you always have to remember to keep humility because you don't know who the audience is or their background, especially in the very beginning stages when you're just building a rapport. You don't know who you're talking to. You don't know the experiences they've lived through, uh, their successes, their triumphs. And so it's very, it's very smart to remain humble so that you don't make a fool of yourself. In our text in Judges 9, 16, or 9, chapter 9, verses 1 through 6 of Judges, It reads, Now Abimelech, the son of Jerubbabel, went to Shechem to his mother's relative and said said to them, and to the whole clan of his mother's family, Say in the ears of the leaders of Shechem, which is better for you, that all seventy of the sons of Jerubbabel rule over you, or that one rule over you? Remember also that I am your, your bone and your flesh. And his mother's relative spoke all these words on his behalf in the ears of the leaders of Shechem. And their hearts inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, He is our brother. And they gave him seventy pieces of silver out of the houses of Baal Pereth, with which Abimelech hired worthless and reckless fellows who followed him. And he went to his father's house at Ophrah and killed his brothers, the sons of Jerubbabel, seventy men on one stone. But Jotham, the youngest of the son of Jerubbabel, was left, for he had hid himself. And all the leaders of Shechem came together, and all Beth Milo, and they went and made Abimelech king by the oak of the pillar in Shechem. So to understand the story of Abimelech, it's important to know where he started. Abimelech stands out as one of the many sons of Gideon. 
The story of Gideon reads like an action movie. Gideon plays the role of an unlikely hero who rises to the challenge against all odds to, to accomplish what most thought to be impossible. After the events of Gideon, we are introduced to Abimelech. Abimelech, one of Gideon's sons, served as a judge of Israel following the judgeship of Gideon. He's first mentioned in Judges 8, 30, and 31, where we read, Gideon had 70 sons of his own, for he had many wives. His concubine, who lived in Shechem, also bore him a son, whom he named Abimelech. There was a serious issue with Abimelech. He was not made of the same stuff as his father Gideon. The story of Gideon starts with God's calling of Gideon, and, and the, the name that he was called was Mighty Warrior. This proclamation is amazing because Gideon was not a mighty warrior at the time of God's declaration. He was living in a spiritually backslidden nation and family. God instructed him to tear down his family's altar to Baal and the Asherah poles. He threshed wheat while hiding in a wine press so that the Midianites would not see him and take the wheat. Gideon describes himself like this in Judges 6.15. My clan is the weakest of all the clans in Manasseh, and I am the least of my family. So we see that God often chooses to use the lowly to raise up, and that is what he did with Gideon. But Abimelech was not Gideon. He was a lot more like the leaders that we see in the world today and throughout history. So this brings me to my first point, which is Abimelech's murderous rise. Gideon had rejected the kingship officially in Judges 8.23, but Abimelech desired it for himself. He hated his half-brothers, possibly because he was the son of a concubine rather than the son of Gideon's wives. Shechem was one of the older city-states in Canaan. The Canaanites were its primary inhabitants, and as we can see from this story, the Canaanite people of Shechem seemed to have been more open to having a king over them than the Israelites, as we read in our text in Judges 9-6. As a local boy, as well as the son of Gideon, the famous military leader, the, the Shechemites favored accepting Abimelech as their king. Even when Gideon's shortcomings, he had the right understanding of God's sovereignty over Israel. In Judges 8, 22 through 23, it says, Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, you and your sons, and your grandsons also, for you have saved us from the hand of Midian. Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, and my son will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. So Abimelech, on the other hand, leaves the Lord out of the picture entirely. It would seem that Abimelech felt that Gideon's other sons were ambitious and wanted to be king too. There's no indication in the text that any of them felt this way. He was perhaps projecting his feelings on them, which is often true of ambitious people. Overly ambitious people can sometimes become paranoid, as Abimelech did, as well as King Saul later on. Abimelech was able to secure some popular and financial support by politicking. He hired some assistants who promoted him and probably helped him to assemble and assassinate 69 of his 70 brothers that we read about in Judges 9.5. He executed this slaughter on one stone, the Bible tells us, suggesting a well-planned mass murder. We can compare and contrast the similar story of Jehu's slaughter of Ahab's sons in 2 Kings 10. It is important to see how the departure from God, the inclusion of idolatry, and the pride that rises up in man can result in this kind of hatred and violence. The men of Shechem would have known about Abimelech's slaughter of his brothers before they had even made him king. It could even be that Abimelech's violent behavior enhanced his value in their eyes. Beth Milo was the citadel in Shechem, the most heavily fortified part of the town. The writer also called it the Tower of Shechem and may have been the fortress temple of Baal Pereth. We know from Judges 8, 33 through 35, that as soon as Gideon died, the Israelites went right back to idol worship. In Judges 8, 33 through 35, it actually reads, as soon as Gideon died, the people of Israel turned again and whored after the Baals and made Baal Pereth their god. 
And the people of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who had delivered them from the hand of all their enemies on every side. They did not show steadfast love to the family of Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, and returned for all the good that he had done to Israel. The inhabitants of Shem, the worshippers of Baal Pareth, carried out the election of Abimelech as king in the very same place in which Joshua had held the last national assembly and had renewed the covenant of Israel with Jehovah, the true covenant God. It was there in all the probability in all this probability that the temple of Baal Pareth was to be found, namely according to Judges 946, near the Tower of Shechem or the citadel of Milo. Abimelech was the first person ever to be crowned king in Israel, as far as the text records show. He started a trend that carried on for all of the Israelite kings. I find this story interesting in part because of the historical synergy. I find it with this kind of rise to power. In the Ottoman Empire and many other Muslim sultanates, it was a common practice for the new sultan to take power. And by the law, once they had consolidated their grip, they had to have all their brothers executed. And the method that was ordained in the Muslim sultanates was that they had to be executed by way of strangulation with a silk cord. So I think it's pretty interesting, this, this murderous thought process that exists throughout our own history, throughout the world's history, that was present in this, his, this, this portion of scripture in the history of the Bible. Before Abimelech's rise to power, his sole surviving brother went into hiding. He protested against Abimelech and predicted the effect of his rule. Jotham stood on the same mountain where six of the Israelite tribes had declared the blessings of abiding by the law of God and denouncing the Shechemites for their foolish and wicked actions. The contrast between the Israelite communities or commitments in Joshua 8 and 24 and this passage must be one reason the writer includes Abimelech's story in Judges. Jotham's fable was a parable with a moral, and it's generally recognized as the first parable in the Bible. It reads in Judges 9, 7 through 21 like this. When it was told to Jotham, he went and stood on the top of Mount Ger Gerizim and cried aloud and said to them, Listen to me, you leaders of Shechem, that God may listen to you. The trees once went out to anoint a king over them, and they said to the olive tree, Reign over us. But the olive tree said to them, I shall leave my abundance, by which gods and men are honored, and go hold sway over the trees. And the tree said to the fig tree, You come and reign over us? But the fig tree said to them, Shall I leave my sweetness and my good fruit and go hold sway over the trees? And the tree said to the vine, You come and reign over us. But the vine said to them, Shall I leave my wine that cheers God and, the, and men and go hold sway over the trees? Then all the trees said to the bramble, You come and reign over us. And the bramble said to the trees, If in good faith you are anointing me king over you, then come and take refuge in my shade. But if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Now, therefore, if you act in good faith and integrity when you made Abimelech king, and if you have dealt with Jerubbabel and his house and have done him as his deeds deserved, for my father fought for you and risked his life and delivered you from the hands of Midian. And you have risen up against my father's house this day and have killed his sons, 70 men on one stone, and have made Abimelech the son of his female servant, king over the leaders of Shechem, or Shechem, because he is your relative. If you then have acted in good faith and integrity with Jerubbabel and with his house this day, then rejoice in Abimelech, and let him also rejoice in you. But if not, let fire come out of Abimelech and devour the leaders of Shechem and Beth Milo. And let fire come out from the leaders of Shechem and from Beth Milo and devour Abimelech. And Jotham ran away and fled and went to, to Beer and lived there because Abimelech, his brother. This indictment of Abimelech was sure to follow. We see in our own society the rise and fall of many who hope to be great men. Even in our current day, polit the politics that we see taking place every day in our lives, we see men and women 
who grasp for power only to achieve it and then fail in disgrace. Society has a way of building up their idol, idols only to subsequently tear them down as soon as they stumble. This brings me to my next point, which is Abimelech's fall and his disgrace. Abimelech ruled over Israel, and it appears to have been a very small in scope as well as short in duration. He was only the ruler of she Shechem and its surrounding territory. He evidently lived at Aruma, about five miles southeast of Shechem. So even though he is the first Israelite king that we hear about in the Bible, he is usually discounted because he was not ordained to be king, nor did he come from an ancestral line of royalty. There were many bad kings of both Israel and Judah, but Abimelech is mostly forgotten. Some scholars would say Abimelech's government was not a monarchical reign, but simply a tyrannical despotism. God intervened with the rule of Abimelech by sending an evil spirit to bring contention between Abimelech and the leaders of, she of Shechem. In Judges 9, 22 through 24, we read the downfall of Abimelech. Abimelech ruled over Israel three years, and God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the leaders of Shechem, and the leaders of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech that the violence done to the 70 sons of Jerubbabel might come and their blood be laid on Abimelech, their brother, who killed them, and on the men of Shechem who strengthened his hand to kill his brothers. One of the leaders, Gael, led an uprising against Abimelech. Gael was evidently a Canaanite who disliked Abimelech because he was the son of Gideon. He also opposed him because Gideon had both destroyed the altar of Baal and Ophrah, and established the worship of God in Israel. Gael, whose name connects with a Hebrew word meaning loathsome, and whose father's name means servant, did not want Abimelech to continue ruling over that part of Canaan. He did not want Shechem to remain under Abimelech's control either. In the end, Abimelech suffers a, a major defeat and is disgraced by the Shechemites. In Judges 9.50-54, we read, then Abimelech went to Thebes and encamped against Thebes and captured it. But there was a strong tower within the city, and all the men and women and all the leaders of the city fled to it and shut themselves in. They went up to the roof of the tower, and Abimelech came to the tower and fought against it and drew near the door of the tower to burn it with fire. And a certain woman threw an upper millstone on Abimelech's head and crushed his skull. Then he called quickly to the young man, his armor bearer, and said to him, Draw your sword and kill me, lest they say of me, a woman killed me, or killed him, and his young man thrust him through, and he died. This brings me to my final point, which is our servant king, Christ Jesus. The story of Abimelech ends with a whimper. The tyrant king is killed, and his followers fade away. So as we finish off Judges 9, with Judges 9, 55 through 57, it says, and when the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, everyone departed his home. Thus God returned to the evil of Abimelech, which he committed against his father in killing his 70 brothers. And God also made all the evil men of Shechem return on their heads. And upon them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jerubbabel. This story from Judges is powerful to me because... We see it repeated so often through the history of mankind. Abimelech's request to be finished off by his armor bearer is similar to Saul's later request to avoid dishonor that we in 1 Samuel 31.4. The careers of Israel's first self-made king, Abimelech, and the first divinely designated king, Saul, end in a very similar kind of disgrace. Abimelech was an idolater from the beginning, and Saul was rejected by God for disobeying God's explicit commands in 1 Samuel 15. It's interesting that the men of Israel would follow such a man as Abimelech. It provides a sad commentary on the moral and spiritual level of God's people at this time, and it also draws a picture for us today. It highlights the fact that mankind can be easily swayed into sin if we disregard the word of God. This is what incomplete obedience to God's law and compromises that we can allow into our lives and what they can produce. In the book of Judges, we see the mercy of God at work. We also see the greatest threats of Israel's existence did not come from the outside. They were not outside enemies that, that devastated Israel so often. Israel's most serious enemy 
has always been, and it still to this day continues to be, the enemy within. She was and is a nation that appears determined to destroy itself. Only the gracious intervention of God prevents this from happening. A pattern that seems to emerge from the story of Gideon, a pivotal turning point in the book of Judges, each major judge's administration concludes with or is followed by Israelite-on-Israelite Israelite violence. The book of Judges ends in chaos. So how then do we as Christians look at the book of Judges and this tale of Abimelech? It goes back to the simplicity of, of the Shema and the commandments of God. So when, when we look at how Jesus paraphrases this, we can look at Mark 12, 29 through 31. Jesus answered and said, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So on April 18th, 1775, when British soldiers ordered John Adams, John Hancock, and the others to disperse in the name of George, the sovereign king of England, Adams responded with, we recognize no sovereign but God and no king but Jesus. As Christians, we need to keep God in his rightful position. God the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are to be our everything. That means we do not place our trust in men and we do not scheme in the hopes of gaining power over our fellow man. We place our trust in the Lord and we serve our fellow man. I'm going to repeat that. We place our trust in the Lord. We place our faith in the Lord, everything into the Lord. And yet we serve our fellow man. Our king is King Jesus, and he is a servant king. It was through his sacrifice that we were able to come to the Father. He is to be our authority. He is to be our example. He is to be our covering, and he is to be our salvation. God's grace has been extended to us, but we have to receive it and live by it. And this brings me to my final you know, portion of scripture as we close this, is John 3, 16 through 18. Very well-known portion of scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in is, or does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So, with that, if I could have every head bowed, every eye closed as we conclude this message today. These verses 17 and 18 of John 3, I believe get passed over in lieu of the more famous 16. Because everybody likes the idea that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish. Everybody likes that. Everybody likes eternal life. But as we see in verse 17, he didn't send Jesus to condemn the world, but in order to, to have a way to be saved. But in 18... We get the hook, we get the, the reality of the statement that you do have to believe in him in order to not be condemned. You have to give over your life and allow him to be your sovereign. Because if you're not willing to do that, then you're already condemned because the sin that is in your life and the sin that is in this world. This is the reality of of Jesus. This is what separates Christianity from all other faiths. Is that you have to accept that Jesus is the one and only way to receive eternal life and salvation through grace. So if this message has impacted you, maybe you're not living a life of humility. Maybe you're not living a life in service of others currently. Maybe you recognize that your ambition is driving you to target your fellow man rather than to serve your fellow man. Maybe this message is, is pointing out the fact that 
your path, your goals, your desires are causing you to live a life that goes against the word of God. And it takes you away from relationship with the Father that actually literally does condemn you because of your sin. Well, then because of this sacrifice that Jesus gave on the cross in Calvary, there is a way to rectify the sin in your own life, the sin in all of our lives, and your, and your past. And that is to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and to turn from the sin that tarnishes your life. If, if this message is spoke to you and that's you, I want you to signify that with an uplifted hand. I can't see it, but God sees everything and he sees your heart at this moment. So if you rose your hand and you meant it, I want you to repeat after me, dear Lord God, I know that I'm a sinner, but I know that your son, Jesus Christ, did die for me. And I repent, which means to turn away from my sin. And I accept Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior as my sovereign and my King. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. That simple prayer writes your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. It's a confession of your sin. It's a turning for away from your sin and repentance and an acceptance of King, of King Jesus. Now, I, as we close this message and we're finished with this podcast today, I just want to you know, thank you for listening this long. And if this message impacted you, I'd love it if you could you know, like, share, and subscribe to this podcast. It helps us get this word and this message out to more people. And I just really want to pray that God will speak to you through these messages and that it will encourage you to be more vocal with your own faith. You can say it as like paying forward, or we could call it paying the fee in the sense that the Great Commission is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I challenge you to share the gospel of Jesus Christ in your life with, with one person today. Because if we can all share the gospel with one person a day, we can change the world. We can, we can help to bring about a new revival in the land because the Bible tells us that his word will not go out to the world and return void. So the more of us that are sharing the gospel, the more seed that is planted for his word, the more likely we'll see the harvest come in our life. So with that, I just want to thank you again for listening. I can't wait for you to come back next time. I hope you have a great week. God bless. Thank you for listening to the PHSA Potter's House Salmon Arm Podcast. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at Potter's House underscore Salmon Arm to keep up to date on what we are doing. Join the conversation and discover how Jesus Christ can revolutionize your life.